Hello. Oh, excellent. I love an audience. How are you doing? All right. Thank you. Brilliant. I thought we'd get started. Oh, you can hear me now. Normally I, do, I can yell. It's not a problem. Um, I am Caroline Carruthers, so thank you very much for coming to my session. I am an interloper for today. <gasps> How dare I? I am not a Chief Information Officer or a CISO. I'm a Chief Data Officer so for my sins. So if you want to hang draw and quarter me, please wait till after the presentation. It's probably going to be making it more interesting. Uh, I am currently the Group Chief Data Officer for a company called Lau, which is a finance company. We're spread across 11 different countries. And previous to that, I was also the first group chief data officer for Network Rail. So that's twice I've set this function up, so there must be physically something wrong with me. But what I wanted to do today was talk a little bit about um, a chapter from my book. Uh, I wrote this with a lovely, lovely person called Peter Jackson, and I always introduce him as my intelligent half. And he's currently the chief data officer for Southern Water. Previous to that, he was the pensions department. So again, very, very clever man. And what we wanted to do with the book was talk a bit more about the Chief Data Officer role. It's still an emerging role. There's a lot of people don't really understand it. And I thought, yes, why don't I just go and stand in front of a whole group of CIOs and tell them what this role does instead? But what I thought I'd do is actually tell you a little story. And I don't know about anybody else, but I travel quite a lot for my role. And as a result, I don't get the time that I would like to with my son. And as a slight aside here, my son is a 14-year-old boy, and I make it my mission in life to embarrass him. I'm pretty sure somewhere in my job description as a parent, it says embarrassed teenage son. So I always mention him in my presentations, and then I go home and tell him all the stories that I've told you about him. And he sits there with his head in his hands going, oh, God, Mum. So if anybody ever meets him, feel free to tell him. Um, but one of the things that we do as a little bit of a tradition with me and my son now is that on a Sunday, it's kind of our morning. So we do this thing where we keep our pyjamas on, we veg out in front of the TV, we eat croissants, we drink orange juice, or books fizz, depending on the type of week I've had. And we watch the worst TV programmes that we can find on the TV. It's just our thing now. I have put that poor boy through Say Yes to the Dress, Chocky Wocky Doodah, uh, Judge Judy. Anybody else watch Judge Judy? Oh, come on, it's great, isn't it? Um, but the one particular one um, that we watched that really hit a note for me was we were watching a programme about hoarding. So if anybody's seen this programme or hasn't seen this programme, uh, what it is is there is a very, very real disorder where people are compelled to hoard. And they're living in houses that I can't call homes anymore because they're not homes. They are crammed so full of stuff that they're not actually usable. They have teeny weeny little paths through different rooms, but they can't use the room anymore. They can't use the cooker because they're full of 1920s rail magazines that they keep just in case. You just don't know here. So there was us watching this TV programme, feeling a bit like looking around going, oh, well, the house could be tidier, but it doesn't look like that. I'm doing all right. When it actually hit me that that is us. In fact, when it comes to business, that's every single one of us. We are doing that to our organisations when it comes to data. We cram so much data. We haven't had a term for it now. Big data. Yay, big data. We, you know, it's got so big, we had to give it a bigger name. How much use is it? Are we using all of it? Really? I had a really good conversation with some decision scientists that I work with. Um, and I don't know about you, but I don't have unlimited resources and I don't have unlimited budget. So I like to try and prioritise and figure out what it is that I'm trying to do with my time and my team's time. And they were telling me that all the data they wanted, it all had to be right now. Absolutely all of it. And we had the discussion and the argument, and I'm sure it's a similar kind of discussion that you've all had with different parts of your business, because they want everything now. And they want it all right, and they want all of it. When I kept trying to get them to focus on, but what do you want first? Everything. But there must be part of it that's more important. No, no, it's all important. When we did some analysis, we actually figured out that of all the data they had available to them, they were using less than 5%. They hadn't touched 
the other 95% in about three years. So, do I use my very limited resources to drive the quality of that 5% up really high, or do I use the same very limited resources to make barely a dent in the quality right across the organisation? I'm not going to hand out prizes for guessing which way I went with that one. So that's, that's about the hoarding principles about. It's about the fact that actually we are doing this to our organisations. We are making our organisations unusable. We can't make decisions because we don't have access to the data. We know that we're replicating processes. We know that we're repeating things because we can't find where it was done before. But oh, not so. it's okay because IT solves it, don't you? You all solve this problem for the whole organisation, right? No? Come on, a little bit of feedback would be good. Yeah. <laughs> yes, not good. Excellent. Okay. So that's the thing. I think in a lot of organisations, actually, quick straw poll, how many of your organisations have a chief data officer? Yay! The table at the front, we like you. <laughs> now, I like all of you too. You're still my friend, don't worry. Um, more and more organisations are starting to put a chief data officer in place now. The reason being that as CIOs, and I have been a CIO before, and a Chief Technology Officer, so I have an awful lot of sympathy for what you have to go through in your roles. Your focus, rightly, is on the infrastructure, the technology, the enablement part of it. Your role tends not to have the time to focus on the data. So that's my role. I'm the data cheerleader for the organisation. And I often use the analogy about the bucket in the water. So I see, and I'm happy to have this argument with anybody in the room, because that always makes an interesting debate. Um, I see your role very much as you make sure that it's the right size bucket in the right place and it's safe and it doesn't have holes in it. And I look after the fluid in the bucket. So I make sure the fluid comes from the right place and goes to the right place and it's the right fluid. If it's water or gin or whatever else you need on Friday night, that's my job. And actually, it's a partnership role. I couldn't do my job without the CIO. And in the organisations that I'm working with now, they feel quite strongly that they couldn't do their job without me. We make it, it's a balance. And in a lot of organisations, that's what we're seeking to do. We're seeking to achieve that balance so that you can devote your time and energy and effort into what you should be looking after. And then we can pop each other up where we need to with the organisation. Does that make sense? So the people who've got a chief data is that the kind of way it works within your organisations? Oh, there's a few notes just for anybody who couldn't see. Okay. But to go back to the hoarding principle for a second, um, there is a very well recognised therapy to deal with people who have hoarding problems. It's called cognitive behavioural therapy. So I am literally suggesting as organisations we all need therapy. All of us. In fact, to be fair, there's quite a lot of people I know I really do think need therapy. No? It's a short presentation. That is a really yeah, short yeah, presentation. Yeah, yeah. We're missing. You know what? We'll go back to that one. I think we deleted the wrong slide. It's my fault. Okay, so to actually use the different aspects of cognitive behavioural pardon me, cognitive behaviour therapy. Thank you very much. It's the Geordie accent, it doesn't work well in presentations sometimes. Um, to use the different aspects, we can actually do these step by step within our organisations. And it gives us a framework to start and tackle some of the hoarding that we know is happening. I mean, does that resonate with anybody? Does anybody else think that they handle... Does anybody in the room think that you store just the right data to do your job? Do you think maybe that we have lots of people who are compelled to just keep it just in case? I have worked for organisations that are literally have never deleted anything. Anything. Um, since it's the, you know, within these four walls... Network Rail only started deleting emails about four years ago. Now, they've had emails for slightly longer than four years. And you can imagine the storage that that was taking up. There wasn't much useful we found in anything. And as a result, it was just clogging everything up. Now, I know that we talk about the cost of data being how many petabytes of storage it costs us. That isn't the cost of the data that you're storing. The cost of your data is every single time you have to repeat a process because it wasn't accessible. Every single time you have definite 
uh, disparate heroes across your organisation, all desperately trying to do the right thing, and they are trying to do the right thing, but they're not working in conjunction with each other, you are wasting effort. Every single time that you make a poor decision because the data that you need wasn't available to you, that is the cost of your data, not how much storage. Because we fall into that trap for such a long time. We fall into the trap of, well, data storage is cheap, we don't have to worry about it, we'll just keep bugging more and more on. We've actually got to the point now where not only can we not see the wood for the trees, we don't value the wood. And if we don't start and actually think about the data with purpose, what is its value? Why are we keeping it? And I'm really sorry, but just in case, I don't think cuts the mustard. It doesn't help anybody. We re I recently um, listened to a fantastic presentation. I really wish I could remember the gentleman's name who I spoke, because I cannot take credit for this. But he showed me a picture of a Stasi report that was written about a dinner party that he was at during the Cold War. He then showed me a picture of his daughter's Facebook entry and there was more information on his daughter's Facebook entry than there was on a Secret Service report. I find that incredibly fascinating. This is what we, we're getting to with data now. And we're so free and easy, and it's out there, but does my company server really need to keep pictures of your dinner? It's probably not going to be the thing that you have to worry about most. So trying to figure out why we're compelled to hoard. Why do we keep it? And these are some of the reasons that we're going through now. These are some of the ideas that we need to start and challenge the business about, going, do you really, really need it? It's like the conversation I had with my decision scientist. 95% of that data they didn't use. 95%. Now, granted, when it comes to decision sciences, I actually think I give them a heart attack every time I talk about deleting things. They get very, very weird when I talk about this kind of stuff. Um, but genuinely, how much of that is really, really useful to them? Of the 95% they've never touched, we're now starting a programme of deleting some of it, but there's a lot of quick wins. About 30% of that data is no-brainers for deleting. Absolute, totally no-brainers. It's repetitive, it's different versions of the truth, it's not reliable, there's no quality to it, so why are we keeping it? So it's those kind of questions that we need to tackle with the business and with different areas of the business and help them put a, a mirror up to them and go, why? Why are we doing this? The next step is basically it's about prioritisation. Now, again, putting myself back in your shoes, wouldn't it be really, really nice if the business came to you and went, I want all of this, but this is the bit I really need now and I can wait for all of that. How often do you have that conversation? because normally they come with, I want all of this. Helping them learn how to prioritise, and come back to the data, which bits are you actually using? Looking at the data lineage, where does it come from? What are they doing with it? Understanding the whole value of the data into information for your organisation can be a complete game changer. There's obviously a very risk adverse side of it. I, have to mention GDPR, I'm really sorry, I'm a data person, I do apologise. If you're like me, I am sick to death of the emails that I'm getting about it and we'll be really, really happy when they stop. But there is a very risk averse side to looking after your data. On the other side, there's an amazing value add as well that we can achieve if we get the balance right. But only through prioritising it will we be able to understand where we should be spending our limited time and limited resources. And the whole idea of working hand-holding the business. So the point three where it talks about decision-making skills, it really is about learning to help the business do this for themselves. When it comes to data, I don't think you're accountable for it. To be perfectly frank, when it comes to data, I don't think I am accountable for it. What I'm accountable for is improving the data literacy of an organisation. I'm accountable for helping the business understand their role when it comes to data and how actually the finance director really does have to pay attention to the finance data. He's, he's responsible for the quality of it. I put the mechanisms in place to help him understand it and make those kind of decisions. Point number four on the list, 
When it talks about professional organiser, there are many, 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 many different tools and companies um, that are out there to help us with this. There is, it's a very specialist area. Having a, a small business as usual team, I'm not a big advocate for big uh, officers of the chief data officer. I don't think it works. It is a transformation programme you take an organisation through and then you leave a small business as usual function in place, depending on the size of your organisation, four, five more roles. Um, but it's that transformation hurdle that you need to get over and it's that bit that you probably don't want to skill yourself up with 50 people just working on this. There's plenty of people that can help with that. Number five I always leave in because I'm a big fan of being kind to ourselves. Whenever we tackle these kind of things, any kind of big transformation is difficult and it's hard work. And if you're CIO, then I know you've been part of one at some point in time. Um, it's really nice to be gentle and kind to ourselves once in a while. So take a breath, enjoy the sunshine, have a nice day. Um, but the most important point for me is always the last one. I liken the data in an organisation to looking after a garden. So if you've got a whole field, which is what you're normally uh, costed with when you first take something, a role like this one, it looks a mess. It looks like um, the spider's been running rampage across the whole, gar the whole landscape. So you bring specialist landscapers in, so this is your transformation, and you create a garden out of this mess that is fit for what you were trying to achieve. Great. Do you think that garden then, once the landscaper goes, looks after itself? Yeah. Anything that's not attended will slowly revert back to its natural state, and data's natural state is chaos. So by having light touches, little, often, and I'm a big fan of assurance, not governance, because I think it's about enablement, not stopping people doing things. You need that kind of regular touch point, simple, consistent, to make sure that you keep on top of your data garden. Do that make sense? Yeah, a couple of nods. A couple of you not so sure, that's all right. Okay. No, slides are all over the place. Um, but what I really want to do is make sure that we had enough time to ask questions, to have a conversation, because I think that's where you'll find more value from this. So, questions? Please say you've got some questions. It'll be really boring listening to me. You touched on the subject of ownership when you spoke about finance yep. a, a little bit earlier. Um, one of the biggest issues I have is with people actually taking ownership for their data. They seem to think we own it. Yep. Or we are the custodians. Mm -hmm. And uh, one challenge I have is that we have some data that's restricted, and actually, I believe it's only a very small amount of that data that's restricted. But because nobody can actually tell me what's restricted, they say, deal with it all in exactly the same way. Take the whole site and make it secure. Whereas if you could identify that little folder, that, you know, mm. it could be just one drawing for all I know. It could be, it's about prioritising your resources, isn't it? Yeah, and you could deal with that differently. But it's getting that onus across to them that this is your data and you own it and you need to be able to tell me that and I'm kind of stuck in that loop. So yeah, it, it's a really, really hard one and it's, yeah. it's where having a kind of focus around data because that's my job, the data cheerleader of the organisation helps in. But um, I have a data council. So on the data council, I have the heads of each one of those big domains and getting them I can't say it was easy to get that set up in the first place, but in that room there is somebody who covers every single piece of data within our organisation. So when we walk into that room, one of them have to be able to make a decision. And don't get me wrong, sometimes it's the biggest bun fight you've ever seen in your life, and I do occasionally lock the door and just shove pizza underneath because they're not getting out. Um, but getting across to them... It, it, Focusing on the risks, because whenever I start it and looking at those kind of roles, I always start on the risk adverse side before I go to the value add side of it, because there are some really, really frightening stories about what can happen around their data. And it's putting the, the face across that if you're not accountable, who is? Because either you're accountable for giving me a decision or you're accountable for telling me who it is that I have to go and talk to and keep putting them on the spot. It's not a comfortable place to be, which is normally why I get shoved in to do it. Um, but that would be a starting point, I would suggest.
Because I think we're stuck at that point that you said where mm -hmm. they're scared. Somebody could go to prison with that. Yeah, so easily. What happens with that later, so they're always going to err on the side of caution. And the, 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 the idea is that um, you have to keep it. Yeah. There's a, I think it was Lockheed Martin, but please don't quote me on this one, um, who went through a pretty serious data breach. And one of the things that people don't realise is that if you have a really, really, really good reason for getting rid of the data, as in, after five years we don't think we need it anymore, yeah. and it's deleted, it can't be held against you. Yeah. So that it's actually in their interests to think about when it's no longer legitimately useful for them. And it was the kind of thing, that decision to not delete data that was 20 years old for Lockheed Martin cost them something like 50 million. Because conversely, we have a 60-day retention rule on our emails. So, 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 there's, so they've got that point. Yeah, so that no, and but that's legal that's driven that because there was a legal issue. If we haven't got the email, nobody can ever request yeah. it. Never, it never waste a good crisis. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's expanding, so if they can do it, the rest of the organisation can do it as well. The biggest problem I see is that most people don't know what the data retention requirements are of data, so they keep everything. Yeah. Nobody understands their data. And one of the things, and one of the conversations that I've had, uh, especially in the place that I'm with now, is that everybody, we, we're putting a data retention policy in place, and that's something that I'm driving at the moment. Um, rather than get into bun fights about Oh, should we keep it for five? Should we keep it for seven? We'll keep it for ten. But still put a limit on it. So if you get them to think about what the limit is, and they'll, they'll five, seven, I mean, I'll, I worked for Network Real, and some of the retention periods had to be like 100 years. We're still using those bridges. Um, in fact, at Network Real, we still, ha we predate the land registry, so we still have Latin scrolls that tell you, that, so that's going well back in history. Um, but it's actually getting them to think about well, if that's the worst, and this is my comfort zone, we'll make that comfort zone a little bit more comfortable, but it's still a hard line. And then it doesn't have to be set in stone. You can slowly move it to a more comfortable, you know, appropriate position. But the hard part and the important part is drawing the line in the sand in the first place. From my own research on this, as long as you write down your data retention policy and then you follow it, because if you don't do what you say you're going to do, then you need to do that. The... the Whenever I put a new program in place, there's, there's three parts to it. One's the information architecture, one is the governance policy, and the third one is always in the hearts and minds, because I have never, ever, ever yet worked anywhere that by just writing something on a piece of paper, people do exactly what I say. The, the engagement piece, the hearts and the mind piece, about getting them to live and breathe the policies, way, way more important than actually writing it in the first place. Yes. My organisation, 25 years ago, did a piece about organisations aren't understanding that their assets just in the way that bridges and customer records. I mean, do, do you make plays in that area? About Abs absolutely, yes. Yeah. So the book does cover... It. It's a really good book, everybody buy. But um, it does actually cover those kind of areas. One of the reasons, and I think it's the dawn of the, the Chief Data Officer and why these rules are coming about, um, is you see a natural evolution with C-level rules, yeah. and they come from the assets. So, you know, the chief people officer, the chief financial officer, those are core assets for your organisation. Now, they didn't already always exist, so they grew, and this is now where the chief data officer is coming from, as more and more organisations recognise their data as a tangible asset. And I think this is one of the, the reasons for me that I try and separate the role of the CIO from the CDO because it's been lumped in with you guys for too long and as a result you thought the business were accountable for it, the business thought you were doing it and they didn't have to worry about it and what's happened is this hole in the middle where nobody treated data as an asset and those kind of things and bringing that to life. I'm a storyteller at heart, that's what I do, I go onto the board and I explain to them where the value of their data comes from, where the risk comes from, and trying to achieve that balance in the middle ground, because I don't really want to terrify them too much, otherwise they'll just all go home. Talk about information architecture. Mm -hmm. Completely with you, 100% on that, but I'm really interested in about your approach to trying to get people to define what their information is. Yeah, slowly, it's a bloody nightmare. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't swear. Um, 
there are certain tools that can help you. So there's, you never put a blank piece of paper up in front of the business. Never, ever, ever. Because if you do, they'll just be like, um, you always give them something to look at. So you can either use tools or you can use some really basic, I kind of know we buy this data and I kind of know we do what this about it, and start and draw boxes. I prefer a collaborative, workshoppy type environment and then just constantly hone. Um, I, I think this was touched upon in one of the sessions earlier on, but for me, perfection is a disease and it's a disease that we all suffer from and it's one that frustrates the living bejesus out of me because it's an excuse for us not to do anything. So I always work on the whole 80-20 rule about, I'll try and get it right-ish, and then we can just constantly hone and make it better and better and better. Is that, I can't see what's saying. Oh, two minutes. I didn't realize I talked that long. Um, another question? Or would you just like two minutes back? One more quick. Okay, one more, yeah. um, I've been a practitioner of data analysis for quite some time now. Um, I went through this exercise on my own hard drive because I got fed up with folders called old, which contained folders called old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, or personal and personal and personal, but yeah. And when I did the actual analysis, which took a hell of a long time, I only found there was only a handful of files which I actually really cared about, stuff which I had the original context that I had written. Everything else I put in a folder called resource. Which is stuff I've accumulated from everybody else. Or, or, or a useful folder at the bottom. Or a useful yeah. 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 And if I lost that, I just get it again. But the original content, my core files, were tiny, absolutely tiny. It was quite horrifying that I only had like 30 files. In it, but that's a perfect example. That's a wonderful example. Because if you're computer, your personal computer is like that, can you imagine what your company store is like? At Network Rail, I did a really cheeky exercise to get my point across because I was having a really um, catch-22 type situation about deleting the data in Network Rail, um, where I told everybody I was deleting it and they didn't believe me. So I pretended to delete it, which was basically I shoved it into a data store and they couldn't see it, so they thought it was deleted. Out of 45,000 employees, two shouted at me. And that was for a really small subset pocket of what I'd hidden. And going back to the board with that experiment was a real start, a, you know, stark a signal to them about, oh, we maybe need, need to take this seriously. Do you want one quick question, then we can... It was a, a point personal out. one in the sense of, do you see yourself moving through this role to something else? I mean, next step for you? Um, to be honest, I really, really like being a Chief Data Officer, yeah. so currently I am just happy doing this role and I think that it's, it's evolving so fast and there's so many different dynamics coming that for now I'm really happy here. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you all very much. Really, really appreciate it.